Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process series, which is a joint project of the POP Conference, IASPM US, and the Journal of Popular Music Studies. Um, I'm Francesca Royster, and I'm here with my other organizers, Kimberly Mack and Carl Wilson, and also welcoming you on the behalf of Eric Weisbard and Carl Stadler. And um, yeah, we're really excited to um have some wonderful guests with us with us today which i'm going to tell you more about in a second um you can find our whole calendar on the iaspum website under the journal of popular music studies tab and you can also get on the the mailing list there um and by contacting eric um you can also catch up on all the videos of all of our past sessions including our sessions um, for the last few weeks. We've had um, some amazing um, panels, internationally minded uh, panels, um, you know, talking about uh, punk music in Ukraine and all kinds of great stuff. Um, so Eric's YouTube channel is a great place to go to um, just soak yourselves in past, um, past, uh, past panels. So our next session is going to be on May 15th. Uh, Kimberly Mack is our own Kimberly Mack will be um, talking about her new book on Living Colors, uh, Time's Up. And it's part of the 33 and a third series. And, um, but today we will be um, welcoming Christine Capitola and Lauren Kramer, Kramer, who will be talking about Black Sound. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. So this conversation between Christine Capitola and Lauren McLeod Kramer attends to the capacious expression of Black sound across cultural, political, and intellectual realms. Sharing their experimental approaches to audiovisual culture, these two wonderful authors offer method methodologies attuned to the alternative spaces and times of Black sonic life. Capitola's sonic feminists, Black culture makers, felt history, and vibrational identity, which is in process, mobilizes the vibrations of Black pop star artists from the 1980s and the 2010s and 2020s as an analytic for understanding both their identity formations and the historic context surrounding them. In the process, Capitola theorizes that feminists or simultaneous gender identity and gender expression grounded in femininity is a sonic, effective, and vibrational configuration. Kramer's A Black Joint, also in process, explores hip hop visual culture's experimental and unruly aesthetics as a contemporary archive of Black spatial practices, the real and imagined architectures designed by and for Black sociality and creative expression. Kramer identifies the joints in hip hop images, the points of articulation between blackness and popular aesthetics as sites of aesthetic formation and potential deformation. The joint is where we can see what blackness may still build. So to tell you a little bit about Christine and Lauren, Christine Capitola is an assistant professor of African-American studies at California State University Fullerton, Capitola works at the intersections of queer, Black, sound, affect, and performance studies. And she's published in Souls, uh, Journal of Popular Music Studies, LA Review of Books, AMP, Musical uh, American Musical Perspectives, and among others. Lauren McLeod Kramer is an assistant professor in the Cinema Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. Her work focuses on the aesthetics of Blackness and popular culture. Lauren is a founding member of Liquid Blackness, a research project on Blackness and aesthetics, and is the co-editor of Liquid Blackness, Journal of Aesthetics and Black Studies. And her writing has appeared in the Journal of Cinema and Media Studies, The Black Scholar, Black Camera, Film Criticism, LA Review of Books, and many others. So I'm going to turn things over now to Christine and Lauren, and I believe we're going to hear from Christine first. Is that right? And they'll be in conversation together. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks so much to Francesca. It's really exciting to be on the other side of Pindip after attending many sessions and to be introduced by you, who I would say has made my work possible. So thank you. For that always, I'm really excited to collaborate with Lauren for the first time in uh, about seven years. So <laughs> looking forward to that. 
I'm going to read, I, I always say this, I'm a humanities scholar, so I read, um, often people read beautiful things from introductions in these sessions, and mine is not written yet. I've written five chapters and half of the epilogue, so we're going to go in through the epilogue and just mix, mix it up that way. And I will have some slides to give people a way to hold on to what I'm saying. And I will not read the chat while I'm talking. <laughs> In May 2021, experimental electronic pop artist Don Richard released her sixth LP album, Second Line and Electro Revival. Named after the brass band parades along which people dance in the streets called Second Lines, the album connects the music of Black New Orleans to electronic music at large, thus an electro revival. The album is narrated by King Creole, Richard's persona that pulls from her family's simultaneous Haitian Creole and Mardi Gras Indian roots, and includes interviews with her mother, whereas her last album, New Breed, included interviews with her father. Named in honor of the indigenous tribes who helped their ancestors escape the plantation during chattel slavery, the Mardi Gras Indians pay homage to shared cultural influences between Black and Indigenous people in New Orleans, as King Creole Richard crosses gender lines and genre lines, as the press for the album narrates. The story of Second Line centers on Dawn's persona King Creole, assassin of stereotypes, a Black girl from the South, at a crossroads in her artistic career. To move forward, she decides to look back, but where previous album New Breed took influence from her father, Second Line is illuminated by Dawn's mother. But why revival? Because Second Line embodies the heritage of soul music and the roots of New Orleans, all surrounded by the influences of electronic futurism. As an assassin of stereotypes, King Creole pressures various supposed binaries, not only female and male, but also past and future and electro and soul. In the spirit of Afrofuturism, King Creole's moving forward involves looking back, and more than that, a sounding back. In this way, King Creole amplifies the role of sound in the formation of race, gender, and sexuality. Often visually presenting as high femme, Richard combines 1980s inspired synthesizers and drum machines with production and transitions that some might describe as masculine, with songs about extending love, care, and tenderness to everyone from one-time lovers to ride or dies to her family in New Orleans. On second line, Richard extends this ethics of care to the project of sonically charting a history of Black electronic dance music over a year before Beyonce would do so on Renaissance and locating part of that story back in New Orleans, which is often left out of electronic music history. Richard kicks off the album with King Creole, which sets the tone and introduces the electro hip hop feel for the rest of the album, particularly a hard feminist that permeates throughout Second Line as a whole. The song opens with an exchange between Richard and her mother before a drum machine, Second Line, marching and dancing beat takes over. I will now strategically play a 20 second clip and then describe the rest of it um, with writing. Okay, and the clip somehow skipped over. So these first lines that are here, have you ever been to a second line? That's Dawn interviewing her mother, and her mother is the one who says, oh, yes, indeed, because you've spent... Anytime in New Orleans, you have definitely been at a second line, as I was many times when I lived there before LA. So by putting her mother's voice at the top of the album, the song establishes matrilineal lineage as a core aspect of King Creole, the Black girl from the South at a crossroads that Richard describes in the press release. Here, the crossroads are not so much a fork in the road as a place where multiple roads cross, intermixing Black musical genres and cultural histories. After the opening dialogue, a drum machine beat enters the song, using the hi-hats to program a second line beat that one might march or dance along to in the streets of New Orleans. At the same time, the beat is entirely electric, bridging electronic dance music and second line brass and percussion traditions. After Richard adds, up jumped the boogie, the blueprint is me, 
midway through the song, a calypso sound enters, hearkening back to her Haitian Creole roots. About 15 seconds later, her backup vocals add chanting to the mix, bringing in a tradition of the Mardi Gras Indians. Declaring, I don't need a genre, fuck it, I am the genre. King Creole both foreshadows the house pop summer of Beyonce and Drake on the horizon only one year later, and shows how Richard pieces together genders and genres across lines of demarcation. And as an aside, another thing I'm working through in the epilogue is a hearkening back to what I would say is a late 90s cash money drum machine programming that's going on a lot in this album too. So happy to talk about that more in the Q&A. Okay, now the, now the seamless transition to what the whole thing is about. In the book project, I trace instances of what I call sonic feminists or sonic expressions of feminists, a simultaneous gender identity and gender expression grounded in femininity. In the process, I've conceptualized sonic feminists as a sonic, effective, and vibrational configuration that reshapes notions of representation and relationality. Sonic and it's centering what is heard, effective, in its transmitting feeling, both emotional and physical, between bodies, and vibrational in how it reverberates or echoes the aforementioned sound and feeling over time. What's powerful about sonic feminists is that someone does not have to visually present in an explicitly feminine way to access it. Rather, sonic feminists is a playing with things that have socially been deemed feminine, from ornate decoration to whispering vocals to emotional care. It is a practice of what Black trans femme artist Tourmaline, as quoted by Omasheke Tinsley, describes as freedom dreams, or quote, when we face our conditions not with despair, but with the deep knowledge that these conditions will change, that a world filled with softness and beauty and care is not only possible, but inevitable. Through Sonic Feminists, I additionally trace the aesthetics and historical connections between Black artists, activists, and intellectuals in the 1980s and the 2010s. In the process, I argue that sound and vibration both intervene in visual stereotypes about Blackness and accentuate how the senses of sight, such sight, sound, and touch ultimately work together. From there, I posit that vibration is a way of both doing history effectively and feeling through the process of identity formation. Across these three aspects of the project, Feminist works as a linchpin from Janet Jackson, Grace Jones and Prince in the 1980s to Blood Orange, Jenna Monet and FK Twigs and Kellala in the 2010s and 2020s. The Black artists in my study embody feminists alongside androgyny to amplify the capacious possibilities for Black genders. As these contemporary Black artists reach back for not only the visual cues, but also the synth lines, drum machine patterns, and subsequent vibrations of their 1980s counterparts, they effectively accentuate the ongoing need for such aesthetic interventions and highlight how the vibrations of the 1980s continue to reverberate in the present. By using these sound affects and vibrations to connect other Black creatives across time and space, the Black musical artists in this study exemplify how we can use the recent past to navigate the similar yet different manifestations of anti-Black racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and femphobia in our present. The book is divided into two sections that organized um, temporally, the 1980s and the 2010s and 2020s. In each chapter, a different album works as a lens or a sonic, effective, and vibrational entry point into the historical moment around it. Janet Jackson's Control, Grace Jones's Slave to the Rhythm, Prince's Sign of the Times, Blood Orange's Negro Swan, Janelle Monet's Dirty Computer, and a joint chapter on FK Twigs's Capra Songs and Kalala's Raven. Additionally, each chapter reverberates back to the one across the book binding to be in conversation with it. So FK Twigs and Kalala to Janet Jackson, Jenna Monet to Grace Jones, and Blood Orange to Prince with the epilogue on Don Richard bringing everything together. And I just have a few slides of kind of the main historical event that each chapter and subsequent like chapter pairing is, is um, speaking to you. So this is Reverberation 1, the unwritten chapter 6 with the fully written chapter 1. So FK Twigs' Capper songs and Kalala's Raven, thinking about Black women uh, indie artists and experimental pop and R&B music and theorizing a Black queer femme 
transatlantic dance music history since FK Choix is based in London and Kalila is based in DC. So thinking as around the Black Atlantic as a Black queer femme space that we don't always think about it as. And then on the other side for Janet Jackson, thinking about control is proposing alternatives to formations of both the welfare queen and Black respectability in the mid 1980s, along with uh, situating her in a bigger conversation about Black women on MTV and that moment in time. And Madonna is included in that chapter given her complex connections to Blackness that we can also always talk more about later. Second pairing, thinking about, um, this is chapter five, Janamine's dirty computer with Grace Jones's slave to the rhythm. So here, both of these chapters are really expanding and layering onto um, theoretical concepts that have also made my work very possible. So thinking about Anne Savakovich's archive of feelings um, as a sonic. So what, what happens when we focus on that aspect of it and having a really cool case study of uh, when I saw Janamine play at a festival in New Orleans on this tour. So thinking about the afterlife of slavery in New Orleans, specifically in conversation with the January 6th insurrection and the, the infamous AOC Instagram story in response to it. So a lot, a lot of work happening in that chapter. In the Grace Jones one, thinking about Seda Hartman's afterlife of slavery, once again, as a sonics, kind of focusing on that aspect of it to zoom in on the controversial MoMA exhibition from 1985 called Primitism in 20th Century Art which is fitting for Jones since that's an, an aesthetic she, she was playing around a lot with in that time and continues to in her performances. And then also the Queen's Diamond Jubilee in 2012 when she played, performed the Slave to the Rhythm and hula hooped for four minutes. Then final pairing, uh, Blood Orange's Negro Swan, which is narrated by Janet Mox, a really important figure in the transgender tipping point and just in like trans media representation and writing. And using this chapter, this is the one that's that's the most personal to me as someone who grew up in Jersey City, so thinking about a queer and trans New York City through this album, alongside the transgender tipping point, and then in conversation with Blair Orange's Idol Prince, and specifically the Sign of the Times album, which has four songs narrated by his female persona, Camille. Um, we'll see if the Camille album is released on Third Man Records in time for me to kind of incorporate it into that chapter. And using that album to think about what James Baldwin in a 1985 essay called The Androgynous Craze of the 1980s and then also the AIDS epidemic. So in conclusion, in conclusion to the short summary of what this project is doing, we are living in a critical moment for feminists. On the one hand, feminists has more mainstream visibility than ever before. The heightened appreciation for feminists stems from both the so-called transgender tipping point, increasing the presence of trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people in the media and Black music artists such as Beyonce, Megan Thee Stallion, Little Nas X, and countless others bringing complex embodiments of Blackness and femininity into popular culture. On the other hand, the onslaught of anti-LGBTQ, anti-TGNC, and anti-reproductive rights legislation seems to have no end in sight working as a direct attack on the political and cultural gains of people who identify as women, femme, LGBTQ, or trans, or gender non-conforming. In this context, feminists is both hyper-visible and hyper-villainized, ushering in porous embodiments of race, gender, and sexuality. Conservatives across the United States seek to actively shut down feminists, while Gen Z and many from these historically marginalized groups cling to feminists as a ray of hope for creating a more just and inclusive world. By tracing these trans historical connections, I underscore how sonic feminist viscerally vibrates, but also changes across time. In the process, this project calls various leftist movements that I've been directly involved with at different moments in time, Black Lives Matter, so-called fourth wave feminism, and radical queer and trans movements in particular to listen and feel with the recent past so as not to constantly recreate our political and cultural strategies in the contemporary moment. Thank you. Okay, I was just closing the chat so I could promise that I also will not read it. Um, thank you so much um, 
for having me here today and you know for Christine uh for the invitation and for the organizers putting this together um before we got started I was telling everyone that um I had a scheduling conflict on Monday evenings all semester so I've had the opportunity since classes ended to just be binging these series and I feel like just incredibly full like having you know been introduced to all of this material um, and seen the spectacular work so I'm, I'm very grateful um so as a person with who really is leaning into like a book in progress or in process um what I'm sharing today is um is like a process document or a sort of a workflow or something like that um to speak a little bit about the origins of this um tell you a little bit about it and then go through a writing exercise that someone made me do that made me incredibly angry which I will tell you about again soon. Um, so uh, this project tentatively called a Black Joint is about um, hip hop visual culture and Black space. I have been saying that phrase for now many years. Um, and what I kind of want to talk about today is um, people pressing me on, what are you talking about? Like, what, is any, what do any of those words mean? So first things first, um, the origins of this project um, are really near and dear to me. And so that's why I guess I'm excited to have like process conversations because um, I have, and I think that this will be something that resonates with a lot of people here, um, you know, an attraction to scale. Like that is my interest in popular culture. I love huge, gigantic things. And fortunately, um, as a, you know, graduate student and junior scholar, like I've, I've been a person who's benefited from like phenomenal mentorship and collaboration that has helped me think through what it means to want to write, want to write about things that are immeasurably big, which is the way that hip hop always feels to me. Hip hop visual culture feels to me while also attending to, um, it's sort of formal specificity of, of various works and that, I could actually attend to the aesthetic genius of hip hop visual culture, not by ignoring scale, but by bringing them together. And that's, I think, very much at the heart of this project is how do I tend to what I believe is some is visionary expressive forms, um, but still need to speak to the mass. Um, so um, here's a little bit of an overview of some of the material in the book that hopefully will make sense for what I say a little bit later. Okay. All right. So hopefully you can see the screen. Um, so um, the uh, book has currently an iteration in my mind, um, three chapters um, or three body chapters. Um, the first of which is on Hype Williams 1998 film Belly, um, which I've loved forever. In some ways, I can't even remember being introduced to this film. It's just something I've always lived with. Um, and in a lot of ways, my attention to it, um, like at, from a scholarly perspective, has come like the emergence of a, or the response to a film review. Um, the New York Times review of the film said, fighting the emphases of Mr. Williams style, referring to Hype Williams, the director, um, the message amounts to too little, too late. The uh, piece goes on and on and on to indicate why it's too much style. There's too much here, which is a phrase that immediately uh, sparks my interest as a person who's interested in popular culture. And so I've been looking to this piece, thinking about the too muchness, which as rendered on screen, ends up in these images of beautiful, deep saturation, um, vivid blues, dark, dark blacks. At sometimes the um the cinematography is you know impenetrable, um, reds, pinks, on and on. Um and I've been thinking about this film that is the the review said it's too little too late indicating the film so stylized that it's unable to get past a sort of nihilistic expression of black life. And, um, and I think that rather than writing this piece off, I am drawn to the relationship between this sort of deep saturation um, and affect and thinking about um, what kind of space um, this film makes for, um, for, uh, moody blues, I think, as you can see on screen. And so um, for each chapter in this book, 
because it's trying to think through space in hopefully really rigorous terms, I'm turning to the help of a black theorist or a uh, black spatial theorist or architect or practitioner um, for help and support. And so here, as I'm trying to think about affective space, I've turned to the work of architect David Ajay, um, who maybe is best known for um, designing the National Museum for African American History, um, the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, which um, if you visited has a feature, um, I don't feel like it, it's funny to say, I don't wanna spoil a building, but. This is, in fact, a part of the experience to me. Um, it is a building that is effectively overwhelming, and it it and it pushes that idea to its furthest limits, in my opinion. Um, the next chapter uh, moves on to think about domestic space, um, and this chapter is on um, Earl Sweatshirts, uh, the film for Earl Sweatshirts, uh, Nowhere Nobody, directed by Naima Ramos Chapman and Terrence Nance. Um, the film is um it's a film for an album made um after the death of earl's father um, that also reckons with black family kinship and loss um and this work it resonates really um in really close ways with the artist's relationship to his mother which has become like a really famed part of his star persona and iconography um and i can talk more about um Bring Earl and that sort of like legacy of this rapper in the uh, Q and A if people are interested. Um, and as I try to think through this piece that's about lost home and lost space, I've turned to the work of um, artist and, art, uh, and architect Amanda Williams, um, who is a recent um, MacArthur Genius Prize winner um, for these spectacular works on color. But in fact, this time around, I'm um, very interested in this project um, called the Colored uh, Theory, which looks at um, or which paints um, homes that are marked for demolition in on Chicago's South Side. And so it's these sort of spaces that think about domesticity that's here and then gone. And then finally, um, my last chapter is looking at two music videos uh, from Kendrick Lamar, um, N95 and The Heart Part Five, um, directed by Kendrick Lamar and Dave Free. Um, it is a beautiful video um, named after um, the respiratory mask and filmed in exteriors in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and this piece is, I think, about it's the way that it expresses Black space. Um, I'm thinking actually about what it means to be outside in the after, you know, um, being inside for three years. Um, and so as I think about this piece um, and the Black spatial practices that attend to the riskiness that it is to be outside, um, I'm looking to the uh, work of the graphic work of artist Torquase Dyson, who thinks about um, making infrastructures for Black life. And on this occasion, I'm really excited because I'm bringing in as theory also Black Instagram, which is my favorite place in the entire world, um, because I firmly believe that the sort of trend of this hashtag we outside was doing a tremendous amount of theory, uh, um, theoretical work thinking about space, risk, environment, infrastructure, health, and the things that we keep doing to live. Um, okay. So let me close this. Perfect. All right. So the last thing I want to briefly do is uh, share this writing exercise with you. So like I said, I have been thinking about Black space for years. I've been carrying these objects around with me for years, telling people I love these. I love this. I love this. Um, this video, you know, particularly Belly, uh, the Kendrick Lamar videos are new. Um, and finally, someone kindly said to me, what is Black space? And I went, you know, like black space. And, you know, these works clearly they have, some of them have some beautiful architectural details and some really storied settings, but if, these are not works um, that are, I think it's sort of overt way about, um, about geography or something that kind of announces itself. And so, but to me, it always felt intuitive. And so someone asked me what's black space and I was given the homework of sitting down to try to figure out what it is. And so that's what I'm gonna read briefly. Um, 
Catherine McKittrick's expansive study of Black life in the wake of transatlantic slavery, demonic grounds, Black women and the cartographies of struggle, begins with a plainly stated claim that is so central to the project that it appears twice in the text. Black matters are spatial matters. The argument conceives of spatial matters in the widest possible terms by considering the formal and informal histories, laws, and activities that contribute to the production of space and blur the distinction between the phys physical and the philosophical conception of space. And given that license from one of my favorite writers, I believe I'm like music videos, sports, um, you know, movies that are too blue, like they should be included in this list of things that make black space. And yet the ongoing dispossession of black people tests even the most abstract definitions of space. At the scale of nation, state, home, and body, black life is rendered ungeographic, meaning the cultural cartog cartog cartographic, legal and scientific language and tools we use to measure and make the built and natural environment cannot place black life worlds. As a result, absences in the production of space and these systems of knowledge are undeniably present. First, for Black people experiencing violent evictions from home and history, and second, for liberal conceptions of citizenship and bodily autonomy that are defined in contradistinction to and therefore reliant upon Black absence. In this context, absence and presence are not mutually exclusive, they travel together. It's possible to acknowledge the profound depths of this erasure and the sophisticated scholarship that defines Black ontology in these terms. At the same time, everyday life, viewed even superficially, readily supplies counterexamples like hip hop in which black culture and influence appear everywhere. There is an incoherence intrinsic to black spatiality that appeals to uncommon sense. It is both an enigmatic absented presentness and alternatively obvious and ubiquitous. The latter description is implied in the artful simplicity of McKittrick's thesis. If black matters are indeed spatial matters, the former describes capacity who and what can be held together, not location. A black joint describes a difference between a general definition of black, um, of space and black space as the distinction between placing and holding. The former refers to a position, whether it's home, employment status, or a system of ranking, and thus recalls the many ways black life is subject to displacement. The production of space is a flexible process. Of course, homes and hierarchies can change, but an emphasis on placement implies exclusivity. For that reason, although the concept of space can be employed in virtually infinite ways, abstractly, mathematically, effectively, and ideologically, it is also easily entangled in the market discourse of property and ownership. Even activist claims to claim space or act activist calls to claim space are subject to common sense neoliberalism. Alternatively, holding blackness, the act of accommodating, convening, and embracing, therefore indicates inclusivity. Black space is the articulation of Blackness, the jointed state of Black people and Black livingness. By holding the full range and depth of Blackness without prescription, proscription, or prescription, Black space can realize its vast dimensions across spatial and temporal boundaries. In simple terms, Black space is everywhere expressions of Blackness meet, geographically or imaginatively. For example, Black space exists along the roots of Black migration, where the past and present movements of Black lives life trace historical trade routes, establish community boundaries, and impact foodways. Less concretely, Black space is also formed through acts like protest, worship, performance, and play that produce and share knowledge and methods for sustaining Black livingness. In their ever-expanding and changing forms, these practices give proof to the existence of Black life worlds, even if they're speculative. In either case, Black space acquires dimension by holding difference. For instance, Black music, make space because sound is a kind of transition transmission it is also an articulation of black space because it doesn't refer to one style one point of origin or time in fact black music would cease to would cease producing black space if an appeal to either pragmatic simplicity or rigorous accounting it sought concrete boundaries fixed dimensions or a point of centralization Instead, Black music speciality is its continued openness to holding every artist riff and rhythm across these coordinates. I'm gonna do one more section, I think. Okay, yeah, last thing. A Black joint argues Black space should be studied at its carefully articulated joints. The points in which Black spatial practices 
hold deep but mobile connections across peoples, spaces, and times. The concept of the black joint is borrowed from architecture, which defines a joint as the surface of separation of two bodies brought into contact and held firmly together, either by a glutinous liquid or by opposing pressures or by the weight of one body lying upon the weight of another. In this detailed but straightforward definition, the joint's intrinsic complexity, the inherent conflict at the point in which architectural forms and systems come together and also break apart against each other, embodies an irreconcilability that is a fitting figure for the articulation of Black space. Of course, in Black popular culture, the joint has its own meaning. The term describes a good song, a popular place, prison, a marijuana cigarette, or a Spike Lee film. In each of these examples, each of these examples parallels the architectural definition by describing points in which things and people come together, but in some cases, not without doing damage to each other. For instance, Lee tells complicated stories about Black people and life by combining scenes of dignity and heroism with violence and criminality. At the same time, the filmmaker's work offers progressive views on gender and sexuality, um, religion and labor, Lee's films also supply the opposite deeply regressive stories and characterizations that seemingly contradict the former. Moreover, instead of expressing these nuances of Black cultural politics in subtle, um, in equally subtle imagery, the films are visually and sonically bold and graphic. This unique combination of political and aesthetic orientations creates a cinematic and televisual Black space that has come to define the artist's work. As such, each individual project and the larger work, body of work is itself a Spike Lee joint. And this art is most interesting and generative as a rendering of Black cultural space when experienced accordingly. And by that, I mean experienced as the whole, as the mass. For instance, by replacing the question, what is Black cinematic or musical or geographical or commercial space, it would be what I'm suggesting is replacing that with a question that takes the joint and expression of Blackness's multiplicity for granted. So what holds Black space? Okay. I'm gonna stop there so I can ask questions for um, Christine and we can get into the combo. I guess we can just just jump right yeah. in. I have one too. Who, who do you want, who wants to start this time? <laughs> oh, that that's, this is a fair. So, I guess the reason that I wanted to share like this process piece um, in which I'm trying to think about like where I know intuitively that I'm interested in this I in the scale of the objects that I'm encountering and yet want to attend to all of these sort of beautiful details in this artistry. So I do see that our work kind of resonating in these ways because I do think that thinking about, you know, when when do vibrations reach a sort of kind of cri the critical point where it might create this sort of um, make Black queer phenomenology sort of cross these spatial or temporal boundaries or create this sort of excess that's like hyper orality, like these different ideas that you're working with. I'm curious about how scale comes into your work. Thanks for that that big question. Maybe it's oh, I like about. big. Yeah. Well, we're we're going big in this session, and that that means I can also bring in one of the things I first highlighted about um, what you said too, as I'm answering, and just right off the bat and talking about High Williams belly, this too muchness. I think I'm very interested in too muchness in in my own work, and in, in two ways. First, as an emotionally sensitive person, that's just something I've heard um, my entire life. Not always as a Compliments. I think that's what draws me to writing about um, the people I write about as a white queer and gender queer person is that actually black women and black fem fem women in particular in the golden era of pop and R&B in the late 90s were the first people who showed me that was actually possible. And um, Janet Janet's I Get Lonely, the video is a very proto queer moment for me. I was 10 when that came out, not so much because of any sexualization of it I was not doing at that age or just for like the kinds of intimacy and collectivity it portrayed. So for me then in my work, the too muchness is the way that emotionality gets stereotyped and gendered. And then the, and I've written about this in, in other places too that are non-academic, how much more layered that is then for black women who 
as Black people are stereotypically either denied emotionality or ascribed to like an excessive emotionality onto them. So I guess in that way, now I'm thinking about it, this lens I'm moving with of a particular artist and album out into a historical moment. And that's a result of my American studies training for sure, starting with um, the real lived emotional experiences of Black women or Black femme people that come through in these songs and how the sheer effective and vibrational force of this digital music technology, but also the historical work that I'm doing ends up amplifying that out into a circulation in space to a point where it stays connected to the artist, right, always, but also the bigger it gets also there's more space for interpretation and for people to feel moved with it as they as they do. So maybe to flip the question back onto you, since you started with this big idea of too muchness, how you see that coming through maybe across the three case studies as much as you want to riff on that today as it like too much, how much is too muchness and in which ways like an aspect of how you're theorizing blackness, especially in this space of the black joint, maybe that's a better way to ask it. I think that what it is coming to be kind of is continually to try to work my way to um, the irreconcilable. I think that um, I think that in trying to work through black popular culture or cinema, you know, music, video, film, et cetera, like that there is a sense that we want to unmoor ourselves from, um, the sort of limitations of a strictly representational approach. And that I remember the minute I started was reading work like that, that was very freeing, but I also knew at the same time that I, um, I didn't want to say, well, it's this and that. Um, like, I didn't want to, like, I was like, that's not quite the confusion. So I'm trying to get at um, a really specific kinds of irreconcilability. Um, so, and I think that that's, you know, I think that Hype Williams is an artist who maybe like might make that idea like really surprisingly clear, even though it sounds counterintuitive in the sense that that work is, it's too much. Um, there's too much going on in that film, um, but that its precision is, you know, um, you know, is, is without question. Um, I similarly think that um, what the architects and spatial theorists that I'm looking to, like they're helping tremendously because like these artists, their practices are incredibly specific and yet they are by like the nature of what they do and building, you know, a building for the Smithsonian um, or doing these art projects expand the entire South side of Chicago. They're demonstrating um, really specific kind of affective experiences, spatial experiences, relationships to property and history and time. Um, that gain specificity in their scale. And so that's how I feel like I keep looking for too muchness, uh, too muchness that is quite distinct. But that's a, it's a hard balance. I feel like as a writing, you have to write almost through it, it feels like. We, I have another one. Oh. oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was muted, but you go ahead. <laughs> I win. Um, so, this is another writing question. Um, sometimes when I encounter these works, um, like the Earl Sweatshirt music video, if it, people haven't seen it, it's, now it's been many years, but it's, I recommend it, it's so beautiful. Sometimes when I encounter this work, I'm like, this is smarter than I am. Like this doesn't need me. Um, and that's why I feel like I have to, I wanted to end today by making sure I talked about the fact that I can say that I'm thinking about joints, but I have to acknowledge that like, the people who already theorized the joint, like hip hop and you know popular culture, already did it before, way before me. It's and it made the in, that word infinitely more interesting than I can. And so I'm curious about like what happens when you're writing about you know um, affect in black music and feminists, and then Janelle Monae comes out with an emotion picture. Like, are you just like, well, I guess I'll go home. Like, what is you know, I think, because I do think that that's an interesting thing for people who want to attend to this work in ways that acknowledge how sophisticated it is. Thank you for another 
Great big question. I, I was thinking before this about I started uh, my master's 10 years ago next month. So yeah, just what it means to be a decade into this and and thinking about it in this moment. And I, I started at NYU Performance Studies, which is a very niche and particular place to do sound studies and to learn it especially. Um, and, you know, just coming into Black studies as a white person and now like teaching in, in a Black studies department in, in that identity as well, I, I feel very aware all the time of wanting as much as I can to go to what the artists are saying about their songs and building out the theorizations from there. So just thinking about the Janet chapter in particular, going through so much interview footage around control and just finding that she was talking about feeling and emotion. So you're right, right? like when we write about any artist, especially I, I think all the artists in, in my book are very smart and the work can stand on its own and be interpreted in a lot of different ways. So I, I think when I'm teaching and writing, just trying as much to have the artist voice in there, especially given my lack of shared lived experience with, with Blackness, you know, throughout the book as a whole. And then also to give myself the space to run with the interpretation that I'm making and to remember that we're always making an interpretation and it's not the only interpretation and that there are generous ways to interact with other people's interpretation that are not just dismissing what other people are saying. I think they, they did a good job at NYU at training us to not write that way. So it's something I had to fight for more in, in other programs and places. But I wonder, yeah, how you how you sit with this question too of interpretation, situating, situating yourself in the interpretation, leaving space for the work to still be smart in other ways on its own, to use your, your phrasing. Um, well, I think that after a while, I had to realize that uh, this project, I think that I'm documenting like I really am kind of working like this is what's here this work is giving us in a way to imagine living this um in ways that were so crystallized to me during the pandemic um and so I feel like my contribution is just is to document what's happening what what I believe to be happening in the work in ways that hopefully indicate like continue what their the work is doing which is like making popular and making widely accessible a lot of techniques for black survival and livingness in which case I think that like the person who attempts to like write that down um and find those strategies and techniques I'd like to think is a kind of if it's a continuation of that process um getting those techniques for black living out wider. So they're seen and understood. Um, and hopefully in some ways changing, um, changing the way that we talk about the work. Um, but yeah, I bet I feel like I'm, I'm recording what Hype Williams knew way before I thought about grad school probably, so. Yeah. Should we open it up? We can, if un, unless there's anything, if you have, if you have another question, you want to, we have a little time, and we've got, we've got some questions in the chat, but we, we were waiting on some more. So, yeah, maybe, if, maybe if one of you have a final question to wrap your part of it up, and then we'll go. Maybe a final connection. I just, I went, I was like boxing certain things you said within my note along the way, and I think uh, protests and play is being a part. A point of connection across both of our work. I know, especially like in my Grace Jones chapter, there there's no getting away from capitalism in that chapter. And that's most of my entry point too is yeah, what what is the space within? I don't know if maybe you have anything to add about the black joint within, yeah, the space of capitalism and its inescapability. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's and I think going through the artists that you're working with, like I think that this idea of like these artists know how to are creating this work that like transcends these temporal boundaries like the I'm so excited about the uh, organization of this book like this is incredible um that these artists who kind of know and have this sense of this sort of you know 
spatially and temporally open communication that's happening for me like they're modeling what we need you know in moments of crisis and so at the same time i am always aware of the fact that like blackness i think black popular culture wants to extend that advice out but like that i have hesitation about like the idea that um, the idea that it will become Don Richard's responsibility to show us what, you know, how we live, you know, in these ways where, you know, the way that she's thinking through blackness and indigeneity, like that, that's something beautiful and that she's giving us, but like that it's not her responsibility how to teach us how to do something that we should know how to do. And so, yeah, that, that question of like, what we believe that these artists are doing in the context um, of a kind of sort of constant extractive value that they have for us. Um, it's kind of always a stressful point. Yeah, I just, I wanted to talk back to that too. There, there, there are multiple moments per chapter where it's kind of reflecting on this responsibility we nationally put on black women to do this work. I mean, po politically, um, definitely culturally. Mm -hmm. as well and just to throw into the conversation I'm, I'm halfway through I had to put it down for a variety of reasons but have it with me um Marquise Bay's Black Trans and Feminism which is so smart and and raising so many questions to me there there's a section I think I'm, I'm writing through or with in, in one of the chapters I'm revising where they you know they in, in this I would say post-humanist sector right of, of Black studies that a lot of people are in right now too just asking how can we continue to rely on these these categories of black and, and women and especially black women together if if their constitution comes from exclusion and exploitation and i think i'm really sitting with that that section a lot in the blood orange chapter because and in the project as a whole because um don richard is still a self-identified black woman moving through the world in that way and in the world that we're in these these labels still have meaning so how do you sit with making an interpretation of it but then also not asking people to do that work um my friend Ayanna Dozier wrote the Velvet Rope 33rd and a third book and just mm -hmm. I know when she was writing it that that was a really important question for her to ask that's really inspired my work she, she's someone who's really pushed my work a lot over the years of just what would it mean to let black culture um, not have to be working sometimes and, mm -hmm. and just be a culture point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that, I think that that's sort of like the touchstone that I come back to when I find I'm kind of falling into something of that sort of space, like, oh, look, this is what they can show us about how to do, you know, how to live, how to survive a pandemic, how to, you know, this is what like that, um, like is coming back to this issue of not being productive. And I think that that might even be, his belly is so much like the origins of this project. And I think that some of it, that might be, because initially I would describe this film and I'd say, you know, it probably doesn't work. And yet, and so I knew that there was something to say, even though I was saying it, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it doesn't work. Um, and then I was like, oh, wait, that's the point. <laughs> like, that's why it's so good to me um, is it's not working. And like, there's moments where the film doesn't even show up for you. And I mean that really literally, cause you cannot see anything. Um, and so I have to like kind of touch back to the moments where this work or this, this art doesn't work. And then the moments where maybe I think in hip hop fandom, there's so much protection um, being aware of the fact, the ways in which hip hop is um what is feels so vital about it and so incredible and like often like radical to me is its willingness to give itself up um and so uh even that is a po another point of tension um when you when these are like precious objects to you because we learn we love our research objects you know um but that hip-hop like it's the speed that it metabolizes itself and everything around it is is part of it. You can't separate that and call that the less, you know, it's lesser forms or something like that. That's, that pace is really, really crucial. That was great. Thank you. Um, I, uh, we will go to the, go to the audience now and um, 
I'll call on people and ask you to unmute and ask your questions. And the first person we have up is Antonia Rudolph. Hey, y'all, can you hear me? Um, hey, thank you for this both very rich presentations. Um, my question was for Christine about um, Janet Jackson in particular and what I have gathered Janet, Jack Janet Jackson's ambivalence about feminists. It has seemed that the feminist she's performing is at a cost that she would prefer to be more androgynous, if not tomboyish, if left to her own devices. Um, and so is there, do you have any thoughts about a feminist that seems to be, um, she performs it convincingly, but it seems in her personal own personal narrative, um, she doesn't necessarily want to be doing that. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I haven't quite thought about the word ambivalent in, rela in relationship to her yet, but now I'm thinking about it. And I'm, I'm thinking especially of that time period um, because it was very, very like blazer pantsuit for Janet, but then still had like hairstyles in a way that felt a little bit more feminine to me. And um, like the one dangling like key earring, especially in the, the video for Control, I, I think she's a good example of a uh, part of what I read from the epilogue that would also be in the introduction when I write it last, as I always write the introduction of just going back to this idea of sonic feminists as not having to be connected to visual feminists necessarily, because another person, I think people would say, is that person really femme? And this, this visual would be Grace Jones. And so with her, especially, there's a lot of creative gymnastics that happens, but for me, the feminist of Janet on that album is this connection to emotionality that comes out through, right, first the interviews. Um, they're really great if you ever want to go watch them on YouTube. And then through, I mean, the, the way I argue feminist in that chapter is, it's actually offering like almost a third femininity to that moment against or, or feet or yeah, no, I'll say femininity because welfare queen is still is still feminized, but in this highly sexualized way. And then the like glass ceiling breaking woman in a pink suit, and then what whatever black respectability version you want to think about. So the the feminist in that chapter is she she's with Jimmy and Jam and Cherry Lewis for the first time. They're intentionally going with a hip hop production sound, especially on the drum machines, and they describe it as very rough and not feminine. And then she's bringing this emotionality. I mean, I think that album is one of the more autobiographical ones for her that comes out of actual lived experiences. So her own experiences as a Black woman channeled through lyrics, but then funneled through this masculinized music production gives us sonic feminists as an analytic where femininity takes a feminine thing, but it's actually re reworking different things along the gender spectrum. If that answered it, I think. Thanks. Um, one uh, little anecdote just in relationship to Jim and Lewis and Janet, that way that we got in the closing keynote of the pop conference was that they just hung out with her for a few days at the beginning of, uh, of the recording process. And then she was like, when are we going to start working? And they were like, oh, we've been working and started presenting all these song ideas to her which were based on everything she'd been talking about the past few days and so that autobiographical element arose through this kind of subterfuge co collaborative process and that and that kind of plunged her into it in a way that was different than the way she'd made music before that, that was a really fascinating story um alex um do you want to um phrase your uh, urban and rural joint question for Lauren as a, as a question? Sure, and I guess I can also have it um, uh, touch on Christine's work as well. Um, yeah, I was really sort of struck, Lauren, when you, when you brought up um, the notion of black space as capacity, not location. And I was thinking a lot about how the joint might problematize or create a third space beyond like the rural urban false binary where urban, always just sort of is like a another word for black and black in a very sort of ungeographically specific often sort of boogeyman space i tend to think of like the sort of you know um 
the the uh, fearful image of the like kind of the dark alleyway in in New York or or some kind of um, unspecified urban dwelling um, in that way, and then of course like rural meaning country meaning white. Um, uh, and so I was thinking about how joint might problematize that really sort of reductive racist notion of, of, of space. But I was also thinking about it with Christine's work too, which I hadn't really thought of. And obviously I've, I've chatted with you quite a bit, Christine, about, about sonic feminists for a while, but I was thinking about like the, the place of origins of the artists that you're having in dialogue with one another. The Midwest is obviously a very prominent space and the sort of ambivalence between the Midwest and the South, if we're talking about Janelle Monet. Uh, as well as like kind of the transnational in terms of Grace Jones in relation to Deb Hines in relation to Twigs. Um, they're not sort of neatly um, assigned to the urban rural divide either. Um, Prince obviously too, right? Uh, and also like the, the, um, the technologies that are being called upon also problematize a clear sense of place while also evoking it if we're talking about like Don Richard or Colella. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a clear question, but I mean, maybe to kind of distill it, like, how are we, how are you able to kind of problematize or work our way out of the rural urban divide and the kind of racist imaginary that, that, um, that cluster is often used to, to, to deploy our understanding of blackness. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's, I think that that was a, another like really crucial part of like the development of this project was that sort of euphemistic sort of use of urban, um, urban audiences, urban music. Um, and I think that this idea that it, there's another option there or create, kind of creates a problematizes the binaries, exactly it. I think that, or what I'm thinking through is a methodology that attends to the fact that space races people and you know people race space and you know and based on that idea like how what's a methodology that actually just like attends to that circularity rather than trying to parse it like that's not true that's not actually that's not factual um black people live all over the place but rather to think through okay how might that be another marker of the ongoingness of Black livingness is its relationships to space, um, is this sort of mutuality between um, Black people, Black livingness, and Black environments um, that are attending to each other, in which case, you know, what people call urban and rural, you know, might not change, but they, they are in flux, I think. Um, yeah, that's what I'm hoping that something like the joint can do, Christine. Thanks for this question, Alex. I'm still thinking about how to answer. I'll say first, ch chapter six is going to be the most explicitly place-driven chapters. You're giving me um, some, some good additional framing for that. The Midwest is, is a big part of this book because, right, like control is also uh, recorded in Minneapolis. So I think there's, you know, there might be something there to think about and just how none of the artists I write about, maybe besides Kalala, well, I think she's in LA now anyway. So um, most of them were not born in big cities. So maybe like thinking about how, I think two things happen, right? I grew up literally across the river from New York City. I think I think two things can happen when you think about these really big cities like in New York or in LA. And one is like you get there and and what you brought is left behind or erased or diluted in some way because you become a part of that place. Or or if you already live there, then people from other places are, are ruining your city as if we all haven't moved around a lot. So I wonder as I'm continuing to revise how to keep sitting with, maybe going back to this idea of too muchness, um, holding multiple places and spaces together, starting in, in this very autobiographical way of the artist to move around and then create music from those experiences, but then um, in this larger scale way. And the FK Toys and Color chapter, think about the circulation of Black dance music around the diaspora and its relationship to pop pop and R&B in particular. Thanks for that.
Um, I think our next question is from Dan DePiro. Um, Dan, ask one of your two questions and then we'll come back to you after um, we've gotten other people to. Sounds good. Um, hi, thanks so much. This was great. Um, uh, Lauren, I, I wasn't sure if I like caught this exactly right, but it was like one of the last things that you were reading. Um, what holds black space? And I guess that could also be, first of all, did I hear it correctly and or remember it correctly? And second of all, if so, like, I guess that could be my question. Um, like what is uh, in my imagination big enough to hold black space? And um, and then I guess like a tangential thought is like, is is that where aesthetics comes up? Or like, what is the relationship between Black aesthetics and Black space. Thank you for that. So actually, that's so funny. Um, I think that, so the last thing I said was what, uh, I did say what holds Black space. I actually think that I, who knows if that was a typo, but <laughs> I am interested in what Black space holds and what holds Black space. And I think that it, it's the way that I can think through um, the scale of hip hop visual culture, um, but and getting rid of sort of narratives about marginal and marginalization and things that are not that are not true to contemporary hip hop. Um, and then that is exactly where aesthetics come together in the sense that in the sort of formal reimagining that that is that is dimension. Like that's how I'm thinking through the way that black space becomes dimensional is is through difference. And I think that that's an aesthetic negotiation um, and a sort of constant expanding, um, you know, kind of to Christine's project, what is the visual, what is sonic um, by these sort of much, much more complicated sensory experiences. Um, and so, yeah, that's where, that's where form comes to be. And I think that what I'm suggesting is that hip hop images, there's some aspects of this that are very hard to see. It's very hard to there to render black kinship in an anti-black world, but that these videos, for instance, can show us that in these sort of views of domestic life, but they're not ones that are going to be immediately legible because that is not, you know, um black family is not part of visuality. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Um, Amir Douglas, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, um, thank you so much, you both, for your riveting discussion. It is so such a pleasure to really see what's in the field, especially for sound studies, black studies, and et cetera. So my question is for you both. Um, I noticed that both of your works aims at being as occupying a space or a place, whether that be the transatlantic, feminist, excess, sound, and Blackness. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how are you thinking through these artists and genre? And when I mean by genre, you can take it any way you want. You can, you can think of genre as in music genre, you can take genre as in human, um, but I'm really thinking of genre as um, roots and roots, R-O-U-T-E. So how are you really thinking about that? I'll start another, another generative question <laughs> with a lot to think about. Yeah, I think I, I'm always writing about musical genre. I think siloing any artist into a single genre is just not productive and not how artists see themselves so as much as I can. Just tracing all the different musical influences a particular fun one in the book is slave to the rhythm was you know trevor horton collaboration and a clear like go-go move that also ha had some dollar signs behind it in that moment in time so that yeah that's one i think that's that was really fun to work through another thing that's kind of the unspoken genre that's being engaged with in every chapter is queerness um and in in the the tradition of queer theory I was trained in, just thinking about it in a really expansive way, not wanting to lose its connection to queer people, but just thinking about it more non-normatively, right? Like Christians is a queer icon has said 
things over time that suggest a possible bisexuality. I just, I don't even, and I have one of those quotes in that chapter, it, just, it actually just doesn't really matter. Um, so I think queerness for me is a big genre that comes up in the book and helps me theorize sonic feminists and this, this capacity of femininity to be moving along these spectrums, right? Thinking about queerness in the Kathy Cohen way of just a coalition of different minority spectrums and how does that play out in sound and vibration and pop music where um, it is still very fun to let it to let it be fun as Lauren reminded us of the importance of doing but you know part of why I think I focus on the work is to remind us of what pop music can do as we're enjoying it it's been such a such a 30 such a past 30 years of you know only 30, 30 years ago is not considered a legitimate object of study in the humanities so just what's happened in 30 years through sound studies so wanting wanting to yeah carry those histories with me but while also giving it time to just be fun because that's how it's such a survival tool for me and I think it's so many other people that's it's such a good question I think that one of the reasons I'm really kind of like delighted to be here but also nervous is because I'm like oh I'm with the sound people like they, they get it right. Like they are, you know, you got it. And so, because I'm not trying to end sound studies. Um, and so genre is a term that I, that I, is a, like a, a stress point. Um, and, but I really find your sense of like roots and roots uh, and routes. I don't know if that would accent that, you know, really helpful because, um, you know, as I like look across these chapters, like they are about, aesthetic experimentation in uprooting, you know, um, genres <laughs> of identity that are kind of closed off, like in the sort of most limited sense of what, you know, genre could be sort of. And so, and that it's not, and that it's, it's an uprooting that happens specifically because of the objects movement, because of, um, you know, it's, wide popularity, it's uh, references across, um, you know, various, you know, um, media or um, time periods, like the references that I think the connections between Hype Williams' work and Krista Thompson like beautifully connects Hype Williams' work to like the Dutch masters of light. And like, like in that move, that that is, that that is how we can understand aesthetics as a route um, that up, uproots, you know what I mean? So I think that um, that's a beautiful way to describe. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you both. This is exceptional and I can't wait to read your works. Me too. Um, Timothy and Burnside, do you want to unmute and ask? Sure, and thank you. Apologies for not being on camera. I am driving home from the museum. Um, but I just really wanted to listen in today because these topics I just are, think are so wonderful. And um, I, one, wanted to offer support or resources considering we have an exhibition on place within the National Museum of African American History and Culture that could potentially, you know, have some alignment in your thinking about how to present those things. Um, it's its own place and then we're talking about place as well as all of the work that we've been doing in the collections I've been working on in particular around contemporary um, music. So I, I challenge that, that idea directly that it has to be older than 30 years to be, you know, museum worthy, definitely. <laughs> um, but also these, uh, the relationships that the visual aesthetic um, brings to a lot of these conversations that the performers or the artists have with their audiences and how those moments and memories are truly held in that material culture and the connections that are made and the often like very deep connections that you might have or develop over time, whether that is present, present in a music video or a performance or something along those lines. And so um, both just kind of offering that as something I'm, I'm wondering how much you're thinking about that, but then also offering, you know, and for everyone, just always what I always say, in these moments is please come to the museum as a resource you know I have in the collection Janet's key earring from the Rhythm Nation cover and the tour and it will be on display next summer quiet is kept um, and so images and context and whatever um, our collections can do to be helpful in your work 
um, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. But I was, I was curious about how you're thinking about the role that the material culture in these moments um, plays. Thank you for that. Um, I love the museum. Have not have not been there when the key earring was out, so now I have to <laughs> my next trip back. Uh, I'll start, I think, with the visual and then go to the material. Um, another inspirational figure for me is, is Robin James. I think they do such a great job in their work of warning against um, creating new hierarchies of the senses, which some sound studies work does. Suddenly, we're talking about the sound, the sounds, and there's no visuality anymore. So for me, all these artists are recent enough that they have music videos that they can work with. And they're, they're a really important part of each chapter, how I end up theorizing visuality when I'm talking about the visuals. It, um, and maybe I'm asking it to do too much work again, and we'll be thinking about that after this conversation. But the music video offers us a visual of how, how sound, vibration, and affect might change how we relate to one another. So I put a lot of attention on um, which instruments and the materiality of their sounds and moments while there are these relational moments in the music videos. So for me, sound brings us back to the importance of all the senses together. And even as my entry point is not the visual, I'm also never not talking about the visual in this project because I just think it's not, I think it's not possible to write about music um, from the 80s onward because of what music videos have done and just album art before that even. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting question. I think that um, I might th I think about this work sometimes in ways in a sense of like that it is performing curatorial work, like this idea, like, you know, as I think about the scale, like it's so big, you know, part of that is thinking, oh, well, Kendrick's video was filmed in the same place as Solange's video from X number of years before that. And so like that there is a really, really rich visual culture being exchanged by these artists, whether we catch it or not. And it's and it crosses lines of fine art um, and sports and everything. Um, and so in some ways, I think that um, like these videos and these uh, images that I'm interested in are like partnerships and kind of um, what the museum does. Uh, but then of course, like for me, um, you know, it's it's the museum uh, as well. Like that building, that structure is unreal. And, um, and I think just like a, such a beautiful expression of like how, of what I've been thinking of as black spatial practice, how do you unearth three stories, you have to correct me, you know, um, below Washington, you know, the Washington DC, like the mall for blackness. How do you, how do you excavate that? And like, it's sort of incredible. Um, and then the sort of excess at the center of the space with the water feature, it's sort of, um, this is why I see like this, these, um, architects as um, theorists, like that's how I'm treating their work. They're, they're demonstrating the ideas um, with material, with at scale in ways I think is phenomenal. Um, but yeah, I think that I should think more about some more of the material culture because that's another, yeah, the key, like it's part of it. Like the minute you said the key earring, like I just sort of lit up, that was so much memory for me. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we should call time there um, and let people get back to their lives. <laughs> um, Lauren and Christine, thank you so much for a great, great session. And thank you to everybody who came and for your questions. And I just want to remind everybody that, as we said at the beginning, um, Pimbip's own Kimberly Mack um, has her new book, Time's Up, in the 33 and a Third series. And we'll be talking about that next Monday at the same time. So please come back and join us.